Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. If I had known I was going to use your desk, I would have asked you to clean it up. <laughs> I did find the right to speak button, and I do appreciate your recognizing me. Early, early this morning, I received an email from a colleague in the Senate who said to me, and I must admit it was something I had not considered until I read the email, you've not had a chance to speak publicly on this issue before. And most of you know that I chose not to use the position of President of the Senate to try to influence my colleagues on either side of the aisle because I understand the comments of those of you who've spoken that this is very difficult and it's very personal for many people. But I stand before you today wanting to share my position with all of you publicly and to take a stand before you actually vote. I stand before you, and I'll even tell you my age. How old am I? I'm a 68-year-old grandmother. I've been married to the same wonderful man for 44 years this August. I have four adult children and six grandchildren. As far as I know, they're all straight. I have no idea. But the point is, I also grew up in a time where one didn't talk about openly anybody's sexuality. Heterosexuals or straights or gays, where I grew up, you didn't talk about that ever, ever in public. I went to a school where you weren't even allowed to dance because that made you have evil thoughts. <laughs> Believe me, it was a very strict Southern Baptist upbringing. When I go home to visit my relatives, I won't be able to tell them very much about what happened here in Maine today because they still don't understand. I also grew up in a South where I drank out of whites only water fountains. I went to an all white school and the worst part of it was I thought that was okay because that's the way the world was. Things changed and somehow my sister and I managed even though she's still there to learn tolerance, to learn the importance of people's individuality and respecting them and taking them from whence they came. How that happens, I don't know. I think it was because my parents, who probably would never vote the way I'm going to vote, taught me to think and to respect stories like those of the senator from Penobscot, stories like those of the senator from Cumberland. These are my friends. They share their stories and they talk about adoptions. My husband went to school at Central, High, at Central High School in Little Rock when it was closed. People weren't so concerned necessarily about that because he still played football all season even though he didn't have a school to go to. And that was because some little black children wanted to go into the school. Now you ask me, what does this have to do with it? It has to do, to me, with transforming how we view other people and how we accept other people as we go forward. Uh, the good sen senator from Washington, and I very much respect his position, and I have never tried to tell anybody that you're bad or good or indifferent, but I wanted to share something with you. You know, I went to law school late in life, and my professor, I was so naive in my late 60s here, uh, when my family law professor said she wanted to make sure the class was finished on time because she was going, her partner was expecting twins, I thought she meant her law partner. And it turns out that her partner was one of the leading attorneys on these issues in the country, in the nation, in the world. And she was invited to a brown bag lunch in the law school one day, and I still remember this to this day. Some very brave little law student, way younger than me, raised his hand and said, what's wrong with civil unions? One sentence answer, what part of equality do you not understand? That has haunted me for a very, very long time. I attended an inspirational breakfast, as it was called, for Girl Scouts and leaders about two days ago. Janet Mills, the Attorney General, went with me and the Speaker of the House. And we were asked to talk about moments of courage in our lives. The Attorney General spoke about her most frightening moment when she had to speak against a sitting judge, and some of you know her story. The young speaker said the first moment of courage for her was putting her name on the ballot at age 24. For me, it's been all these civil issues 
civil rights issues over time, whether it was parental rights, whether it was choice, whether it was all the things that those old people like me have lived through, those are very hard because people feel so strongly on both sides. And the level of mail you get on either side is very tough. The church and state issue is a very puzzling one to me. I got an email also from the deacon of my church telling me to support this. So I think this is an important thing to consider. People have different beliefs. We need to respect those, but the fundamental issue is fairness and equality. Yesterday, the senator from Cumberland, Senator Davis, read my favorite passage since we're prone to become religious today. And he said to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And that's all we can do today, whoever that is or whoever she is. There's another quote that I want to share with you, and then I won't take up any more of your time, but I thought it was so important that we all have this moment of sharing such very difficult things. A person very close to me was very much in love with a young man. They were almost ready to get married, and this person finally had to deal with his own sexuality, and he was gay. But he grew up where I grew up. And he wanted to know why God made people like him, because he could not find where he was because he had an older father who could not accept that. He's gone on now. But then at that Girl Scout meeting that I told you about, I got an email from a woman that I did not even know, urging me to dig deep and find that courage today, because she talked about how she had to bury her own desires and her relationships, married someone when she really shouldn't have, but she didn't have the freedom to marry the woman that she loved. And she hoped that we would recognize that we are forcing people or causing people to get into relationships that make unhappiness for both of them. Uh, another senator in my caucus used this quote, this quote this morning. She had no idea. It was very much on my mind. But I've heard it once in this chamber before on other issues, but it's very true. Because it's hard to stand up. It is very hard to stand up when people are sending robocalls, ugly emails on both sides of the issues. I'm sorry, I understand the need for civility, and I want to congratulate the chair of the Judiciary Committee and the members of the Judiciary Committee for running one of the best hearings in the state of Maine ever. It was absolutely superb, the civility and the respect. But I challenge you to this. And the Pastor Martin Niemöller. Pastors sometimes are stepping right out there with things that you want to quote. There are two versions, but I'm picking the one that means the most to me. In Germany, they first came for the communist. I didn't speak up. I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak up. I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics. I didn't speak up. I was a Protestant. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak up. However difficult it is for you today, I know that you will do what is best for you, your constituents, and your conscience. This is not a political issue. This is an issue of the heart and of the conscience, and I encourage you to feel comfortable in whatever position you take. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today.